We'll start you. Okay. okay. We're being recorded. Thanks for uh, setting this meeting up. It's uh, quite timely, actually, in terms of um, what lays before us. We've got a campaign now called, which is a, a number of organisations, uh, called Labour for Democracy and Sport Together. And so this year, there's going to be a big push on getting the party to adopt voting reform in its master manifesto and, and ending the party support for first past the post. Make it, you know, to say that what this system we've got doesn't work in our interest as citizens and or subjects, actually, as we are, and doesn't work in our interest as trade unionists as well. Bit of background I've been an activist in a number of unions GMB, uh, USDOR, uh, CW, and now I'm a member of Unite Community and I do what I can locally in my local branch. But I think what's at the heart of the dynamism of trade union is democracy in my view. It doesn't always suit our purposes. Sometimes it can, you know, you get a kickback sometimes in democracy, uh, you know, can feel pretty, whether that be the members or an election or whatever, you know, you, you sometimes think, well, but importantly though, it's the, the central thing, certainly in my experience in my last union, which I was a full-time employee of, nine years a, a national officer elected, 15 years as a general secretary elected and all all of my experience tells me democracy is the key to everything in terms of good governance there's no guarantee whoever you are um that democracy that you will be a good officer or a good activist or whatever but democracy is if you like it's the auto correct of our society and for trade unionists they need to i think wise up to look at the system that we have in this country that doesn't work for us in terms of the number of Labour governments has been, the number of uh, Tory governments has been, and how we we almost got an elective dictate, dictatorship. We wouldn't have had Thatcher in the 80s. On a, it was elected on the minority of the vote, um, and yet had the majority of the power. I haven't got time to go into all the particular statistics, but I think it's time for the... I see uh, the campaign that we're involved in, uh, Labour campaign for electoral reform and the Labour for democracy, which involves a number of organisations, as essential to good governance of our country, um, the propensity to engage in, in wars. All these things are key in, in terms of good democracy. You only have to look around the world and see the countries that have adopted, that have, first past the post and those that don't. A couple of stats, and I won't spend on many because I haven't got the time. But we are the only country in Europe, aside from Belarus, and I mean Europe is in the wider, not just the EU, that has first past the post. The only country in Europe, most emerging economies, most emerging democracies, I should say, tend to adopt some form of proportional representation. Most famously, um, the South African democracy, when one person, one vote was introduced in South Africa, uh, uh, voting reform was introduced. Now, what you'll get, the big thing about uh, PR, one of the big points that people make at meetings is, oh, well, it will end up in coalition. That's the, the worry that most people have. Leave aside the fact there's been more Tory governments than Labour governments, and the fact leaves aside the fact that for about nine years of the last 12 years, we had a, a, um, the, the coalition with the Liberals and then the coalition with... Um, the uh, also unions, the Democratic Unionist Party. So, the, so coalition happens regardless of whether um, you have PR or not. You can get coalitions on the first past the post. But Arthur, so some people say, yeah, but that's true. But there's a, there's more chance of coalitions on the PR, and that, of course, that's the likelihood. But you know what, Arthur Scargo, the, the former leader of the Mine Workers Union, who was a big supporter of PR, said, well, if that's what people vote for, that's what people have to, that's what we have to cope with in terms of governance. And in this country, what we have, and you see this as a result of tensions in the big parties, the Tory and the Labour, what we have in this country is Peter Hitchens, the male columnist wrote, we have coalition before an election, whereas in, in Europe and places like that, 
there's coalitions after an election. So, but you know, there's more likelihood of coalition definitely under PR. But they, even in, you know, that's kind of making out that somehow a coalition is on, in and of itself a bad thing. Well, most trade unions are coalitions. People don't, even though you know you've got affiliated unions of the Labour Party. They're, they're coalitions. We used to poll, when I was General Secretary of the CWU, we used to poll our members after every election, see what way they voted. And we got in 2010, the last time I was there, when this happened, we got 38% uh, of the members voted Labour. 22% uh, sorry, 19% of our members voted Lib Dem. And 22% of our members voted Conservative. There's no shame in that. That's just a fact. People aren't just monolithic so there's coalition there but the big story of, of uh, aside from the recent reforms that's just been introduced in wales where they've just introduced carried through the synod senate uh automatic voter registration stv for local government votes at 16. but of course new zealand is the story new zealand labor party has obtained a majority under pr and just one second Oh, which we, we know we were told that you would you would have and here we have might be special circumstances but nonetheless a majority Labour government under a PR system and what have they done they've actually brought in the Greens even though they've got a majority at junior ministerial level to deal with some of the green issues as it, as it were so it's not beyond the bounds of possibility uh, and I'll finish on this point that you can get a majority government under PR it's possible same thing happened in Scotland, same thing happened in Wales, uh, majority government. The New Zealand Labour Party obtained 49.1% of the vote and ended up with a majority of, of all the seats over Royal. Now, 49.1% of the vote might seem like a fantastic figure. In 1966, Harold Wilson got 48% of the popular vote. And in 1951, one of the great ironies of history. If you say to a lot of people, what is the best Labour government you've ever seen or know of? Most people would say the 45 to 51 government, there was two terms, and it lost in 51. In 1951, Labour got more votes than the Tories, yet lost power. It got 48.8% of the vote. It got more popular votes than the Tories, and yet left office. And we had, as Harold Wilson famously said, 13 wasted years. So it's vital this year in particular, the trade unions, you know, um, start to move towards a better voting system for our country. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Billy. Very good introduction. Uh, over to you, Joe. Thanks, Paul. Um, I feel a bit of a fraud being in this meeting because I need to make a confession at first that I'm I'm a real agnostic when it comes to electoral reform. You know, if I had to press a tick a box on a form about what I felt was it was, you know, my feelings would probably be more, you know, I struggle to care. Um, and so in a way, I represent the person that we need to persuade and talk to because um, I'm not sure what I think about it, but I think a lot about politics. Um, so I think it is a really interesting subject in some ways. Um, this year in January, remember January when we did things like held conferences, um, our regional council voted to support a motion to go to our annual conference for Unison to support um, PR as a voting system. Um, and for many of the reasons that Billy's outlined about um, the current system favouring Tory governments, um, and it was passed. Motions aren't often opposed in our regional council, so I'm not sure it's a groundswell support, but it was passed and it would have gone to annual conference and been debated had um, annual conference actually happened. Um, but when I talked to people about it, I didn't realise, you know, from someone who's a bit agnostic, as I've said, how strongly other people feel about this. So there were some people going, PR, it's the only way forward, it's the future. And other people saying, you know, first past the post is the hill that I will die on. So people do have really strong feelings about it um, and I just thought I should kind of explore what the issues are that I think we need to consider you know if we are going to push for a change to our voting system and the kind of things that people like me will think about which kind of um, points to the arguments that um, people need to make um, I mean I've nearly always lived in a Labour constituency 
Um, and even as a university student, I voted in my home constituency up north um, rather than Canterbury, which of course is now a Labour seat, um, bizarrely. Um, and so for me, there's never, I've never had that sense that other people have of wasting a vote. You know, I've voted Labour, Labour have got in, everything's great, you know, with the current system. And I think, you know, that has influenced my view in lots of ways. But when I speak to people who are, you know, as passionate Labour supporters as I am, who feel that they vote and it doesn't count, um, I do hear that need for change. So you've got to think about what are the criteria by which we would judge any new system. Um, and for me, I mean, first of all, for me, the thing that I want politically more than anything is a Labour government. You know, if you had a voting system where you could only vote if you were wearing a pirate hat and that would deliver a Labour government, I would vote for that because I want a Labour government. So, and it's quite hard for us then to judge new voting systems because we're not objective about this. You know, a new system has to be, to be fair, um, but I can't see that, um, for me, it's not more important. Even if it's unfair and delivers the Labour government, you know, that's what I want more than anything. So I think it is hard for us to kind of judge um, those new systems um, in that light of knowing that we are entirely political, politically partisan. Um, and I do worry that we are, you know, having lost so many times now that we kind of think, oh, well, if you change the system, perhaps we'll win. And we win because we get more people to vote for us. Um, I do think, you know, the stats that Billy was going through, um, our system does need to be fairer. And again, you know, you need to test how fair it is, depending on how it helps your opponents and how much it helps you. Um, and it will give smaller parties a proportionate voice. Um, we know that smaller parties um, are completely done over in the present system. Um, again, as someone who's a political activist, I don't know how I feel about UKIP or the Brexit party or whatever kind of coalition of scum um, Farage cobbles together at the next election doing well. Um, but that is a fairer system. So if it's a fairer system, we have to think about what the consequences are of that, of that fairer system. Um, for me, something which would be a really key feature of any change to the system is whether it encourages people to feel that it matters, that their vote will count, um, and for them to take an interest in politics and feel engaged by it, um, perhaps even to stand, perhaps if they thought, you know, they might stand because they would have more of a chance in a local area where um, a different system applied. And I, as chair of the regional executive for Labour, you know, I do... I do really feel how people who live in places like Tiverton and Honiton, Salisbury, you know, who really want to be involved in campaigning for a Labour government, I do really feel um, how alienated they must feel when we're just focusing on those target marginal seats, which we know we need to win in a first past the post system. Um, so if something which could make everybody feel that their campaigns in their local areas would really make a difference. And again, for all parties, not just for Labour, then I think that would be um, a huge reason to change the system. But I think we face a bigger challenge currently in convincing people that there is a difference between politicians. You know, the non-political um, voter often says, well, they're all the same politicians, aren't they? We've all been out on the doorstep, haven't we, where this people have said, not gonna vote, they're all the same, they're all as bad as each other. Um, so I think getting people politically engaged, but to see that there is a difference and that their vote does matter is really important. Um, finally, I think local representation is important. I, I don't actually think people vote for who their MP is in terms of the person, although I think, you know, there's a small percentage of people who've been helped by an MP who will vote for them, even if they're not their natural political so also people vote in general elections for the party that they want to lead the country but they do need a local mp of someone who will be their voice in parliament and who can be held ac held accountable even if it's not the person they voted for mps are public servants and they need to be held accountable and so i think any new system has to be one where people have a local voice and that they can go and talk to their parliamentary representative um, I think any change to the system is a huge challenge. Getting there is a huge challenge, which we won't even talk about. But, but in particular, Billy talked about coalitions. You know, if we are moving to a system where we um, smaller parties get a bigger set, a bigger say, um, and a bigger role in our parliamentary system, where coalitions are more likely, then we're going to have to stop being less tribal. 
And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. But, you know, we are in a party currently where members of our party call other members of the same party Tories. So if we are going to change to a new system, then we need to have um, an understanding that, you know, the people that we're chucking rocks at the next day might be saying, do you fancy kind of forming coalition and running the country together? So political culture has to change dramatically um, if we are going to change the system. It's um, a huge challenge for us. But I will stop there. Those are just my thoughts about what the um, challenges are. <laughs> Thanks very much, Joe. Um, I think you've stirred the pot very nicely there. Um, no, I mean, I think it is important. I think there are lots of people who uh, who haven't been engaged in a discussion and may have made their minds up about PR, yay or nay, without ever having a discussion about it. And so I think it's really helpful to have that, as it were, ag agnostic uh, voice. So thanks for that. Um, Kevin, over to you, my dear boy, my <laughs> dear man. Evening, everybody. Um, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll be relatively brief because obviously I'm conscious of the time and obviously people will want to ask Q&A. So I'll just give you a part of history. Uh, my name is Kevin Beezer, my former boss, Billy Hay. So I'll have to be careful what I say about him. But <laughs> um, so the CW, Post on Telecom branches, Royal Mail Group, Parcels, Logistics, Telecom and Financial Services. In the southwest, I oversee 13 branches from Worcester to Southampton and everything southwest, including Jersey and Guernsey. Um, and if you have a look at the politics of Jersey and Guernsey, you think we've got problems. Um, so in regards to this particular debate, obviously I covered kind of the political, political committees in the CWU. Um, my personal view is I did vote in May 2011 for PR. Um, Obviously, that's a different position in regards to my union, although the CW position supports votes at 16, but does support first past the post. Um, it's a real issue for our union and lots of other unions about political engagement. Billy touched on the stats in regards to after elections about our own membership, about which way they vote. Even when you had the raw mail privatisation issue, which you know, you'd think you would pull our own members, you know, in, in effectively voting Labour about which way that they do vote is obviously that goes well across the trade union movement. The biggest concern really for, for us, and I suppose for most unions, is something that we're working through at the moment is political engagement. And that's not just representatives or our members, but the wider general public. There seems over the years now, whether that's got to do with first past the post, you know, the two party system that people feel disengaged and you hear it all the time oh well what difference does it make so both the same etc 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 and people feeling disenfranchised in regards to you know if they get the person that they they would like to vote for that actually the chances because the electoral system that they're not going to get one of the things that we're kind of pushing for which has obviously been kind of replicated with the democrats in the u.s election is postal votes about registering people i mean the, the democrats uh, on the ground, um, what they've managed to do in regards to registering people and also pushing that postal vote is something that we're keen on. So you don't just don't have the engagement with people, but actually raising postal votes, which is obviously something that's at the fore at the moment because of COVID. So if you have a look at the, the local elections next year and the mayoral elections and how the campaign is going to operate, a lot of that's going to be online. Um, kind of door knocking and leaflets are probably difficult because of COVID. But there's always been this debate, well, don't don't force postal votes because all that is is going to be Tory votes. We, we don't believe that, quite frankly. I think the rise in the stats on postal votes, uh, it, I think, would do us a lot of good, quite frankly. And also the concern is if we don't kind of have a look at this, what's the next thing? Well, actually, people are going to vote using technology and the security around that. So... I think Joe's quite right about tribal politics as well. Um, you know, and I've seen, we've all seen that and got the scars on our backs for something in the last few years that some people are frightened in our own organisations to voice their opinion because, you know, you, you're just kind of labelled and I don't think that's helpful. And also it turns people off. It turns our reps off. It turns our members off because all they see is if you don't, if you keep your mouth shut, basically, because if you say that you've got a certain view or something, then you're labelled, and that's not helpful, especially at a time when we're trying to engage people. That's the biggest concern that we've got. 
Um, if you have a look back 10 or 20 years ago about political activity, you know, in the Southwest, as an example, we've got a core of people that are political officers in the branches, but actually is the level of, you know, those people coming forward as good as it was? No, it's not, quite frankly. So if we can't engage our own people in the trade union movement, and that's reps and members, et cetera, and we've got direct access to them in the workplace, how we then go out to the wider general public is a real issue. So I'll kind of leave it to that. The only thing I was going to add to that is that when I did vote in 2011, my son, who was just old enough around that time, I was a few years old to vote, I think he was in his early 20s then, he actually voted for first, first past the post and I voted for PR. And we had a big debate, you know, and I explained why I thought, you know, I was a lot older than him. I've seen so many elections. If you look at the percentages of voters of past elections, a lot of the stuff that Bill has said, but he still thought at his age that actually that first past the post was the best system. So we've got lots of work to do. <laughs> if, I, if I can't convince my own son in regards to what the best way forward is, but I just think the, the thing that worries me the most is politically, political engagement, how difficult that's become. I think a lot of it is because it's tribal and quite frankly, people are, will switch off. Thanks very much for that. Uh, where's, where's Nick gone? He's, he's moved on my screen. Oh, there you are. You're up there. Hi, Nick. And what I'm going to suggest is when we come on to questions, if anyone's got any questions they particularly want to ask Nick, we'll, we'll ask you to do that uh, first of all, because Nick's got another engagement he needs to shoot off to. Thanks very much. Over to you, Nick. Thanks, Paul, and thanks for the invite tonight. And good evening, everybody. It's great to see you all here. Um, yeah, the, my engagement, I'll fess up here. Um, when Paul booked me in for this, I was happy to do it. I didn't expect my team to get into the uh, Super League uh, semi-final tonight against Wigan. So they're playing as we speak now. So I've had to uh, put my WhatsApp group up north on, on quiet so my mates aren't messaging me as well. So forgive me for that. I think in, um, when Paul asked me to do this, I, I really, I have to admit, I was a bit like Joe, really. I had to go and scratch it on my head. And I think I've messaged a couple of people who said that my uh, my notes for this um, for this meeting were on a, on a bit of a postage stamp, really, um, which is probably an indicator of where the electoral reform debate is within the party and within the, in the possibly within the tro broader trade union movement. So I've worked, I've been an Usdor activist since, oh crikey, 1991 I think, um, and I and, and worked for Usdor for over 20 years. Um, I live in live and work in Wales as well, so I cover Wales and the southwest for Usdor, so I'll come on to that in a little while, because obviously I've lived, lived for 16 years under proportional representation as the electoral system in Wales. From my union perspective, I really had to dig deep to find out any debate at our annual conference, really, in terms of electoral reform. So sad that I am, I, I managed to dig out our um, report to our annual delegate meeting in 2017. So I was swatting up on that this afternoon, Paul, um, and to find out um, the level of debate there. And I have to say the level of debate was pretty, pretty poor, to be quite honest. Uh, there was a motion that was seconded, then very little, little debate on electoral reform. Uh, and our executive actually opposed the motion on electoral reform. Um, although my political officer says we will always listen to our members and so on and so forth. And it's not a set policy position. So I'm not really quite sure where, where that is. And that might, I don't know, it'd be really interesting in other, from other unions perspectives where, where, where that is. Um, in terms of the change to the system, I think Billy touched on coalition. Um, when I first moved to Wales in 2005, Labour had just gone into a coalition with Plaid Cymru. Um, and all the major unions from recollection supported that because we understood at that time. And I think from a trade union perspective, we've always kind of been the, we felt as though being the ballast in the Labour movement in terms of um, you know, Joe and Kev have talked about that kind of politics and that politics of coalition, and we understood that. Um, I do, however, remember being in the meeting when we, we voted on the coalition, um, 
Neil Kinnock was there and, you know, the old windbag, he, he got up and spoke against it, took a lot of people with him. And, you know, I was, I was a, a relatively um, new, new on the block regional secretary then. The air was still ginger. Um, and some um, previous uh, Usdor officials who lived in Neath, who see Plaid Cymru as the opposition, the Tories out of the opposition there, and it was tribal politics. And I have to say, I've still got, I think Kev said about the scars on the back, I've still got those scars from that meeting. Um, where, if I'm honest, I didn't understand that, that, that about the coalition. But having said that, the coalition I thought worked well. It worked well for trade union members. It worked well for Labour voters. Um, and then of course we crushed Plaid Cymru at the next election. Um, but the coalition does work currently. We've got um, one Liberal Dem Democrat in the in the cabinet uh, and the education minister in 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 the Senate. Mm -hmm. That was forced upon us in order that we 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 could be in power. So I think that um, probably gives a good demonstration of a really positive aspect of Labour just in power, having having just in power, having to form a workable coalition. So that could be something really in, in, as part of this discussion that we need to think about. I think one of the things that we haven't talked about is the boundary review. And of course the boundary review, as we know, if it is implemented in its current reform is just gerrymandering by the Tories for the Tories. Um, and that doesn't sit well. How that fits in with this debate, I'm sure will again, will be an interesting um, proposition really. I did do a bit of research, Paul, so I have educated myself as part of this as well. Um, and it is very, a very complex area, isn't it? And I think, um, I think Joe said about convincing probably somebody like Joe, like yourself, who is immersed in politics every single day of her life, to convince the average punter who we can't get out to vote under the current system, to get them to actually understand, because this is what I think is a difficulty about this. Somebody looks at someone and say, oh no, that's too complicated, mate. I can't even be bothered with that. That's too, when people can't even go and say yes or no in a, in a ballot box, that is one of the challenges that we face, I think, with any proportional representation system. So um, I think that, that is one of, the, one of the real challenges that we face. Um, and I guess getting people to vote at all, is a challenge. So do we need to think about mandatory voting as well? Everybody 16 and over, you go and vote, you've got to go and vote. You know, I think Billy said about what we've got in Wales and I'm absolutely delighted that 16 year olds can go out and vote at our, the Senate elections next, next May. I think it's absolutely really progressive and it's the right thing to do. And then our local government elections the, the, the year later. So, do we need to have mandatory voting from the age of 16? And I'll, fin I'll finish on this, and I'm sure from all the trade union colleagues on this meeting, USDA are currently in the uh, throes of our presidential and national executive council elections. Um, the turnout for those elections last time round was just pathetic, really. Um, and I think, you know, it is one of those real challenges that we've got. So I would say, you know, doing it, that mandatory voting needs to be something to consider alongside this debate as well. So thanks, Paul. Um, and it's interesting, actually, what Joanne said, when Jo said she basically lived in Labour constituencies all her life. Well, Eve and I, this is the seventh constituency we've lived in. I mean, we've been married 52 years, but... It's the seventh constituency and we've never had a Labour MP. Uh, we've been active and campaigned and all over the place and all the rest of it, but we've never had a Labour MP. So, I mean, perhaps that's one of the reasons why it feels particularly uh, important to me. 